I would like to share a few thoughts about how do we go about um, securing cyber physical systems, which is the complicated way that academics use to define uh, IoT systems, uh, automotive, industrial control systems, everything that is attached to a computer but has a physical component. Now, as you may have... Uh, um, clicker not working... It was working when we tested it, so of course it doesn't work now. Uh, yeah, Stefan Esser probably, yeah, of course. So as you may have all uh, seen, uh, we basically belong to the circus. Cybersecurity is a circus and our conferences are a circus. Now when you go to the circus, what you want to see are the attractions. And we all like to see the attractions. So I listed a few attractions. Uh, Barnaby Jack making like an ATM spit $100 bill from remote on a stage in Las Vegas. ATM, $100 bills, Las Vegas, what can possibly go wrong? Um, well, Barnaby Jack, of course, could go wrong about that. So, uh, but, um, and, uh, for, I think that everybody in the room probably knows, uh, Barnaby passed away, uh, way too early. So, uh, this is my way of reminding him. Um, Charlie and Chris, exploiting a Jeep and driving a journalist off the road, uh, to prove a point. Now, what's funny about this specific example? is that Charlie and Chris were not the first ones to do that. This Jeep hack happened in 2015. Actually, in 2010, people from University of California, San Diego, did the very same thing with another vehicle. Why did you never hear about them? Because they presented their research at a scientific conference, so everybody ignored them. Proof that you need to drive Andy Greenberg off the road if you want to prove a point. And finally, this is my friend, colleague, former student, former whatever, uh, Federico Maggi, and now working for Trend Micro FTR, during one of the phases of our research on robot exploitation. So these are the attractions of the cybersecurity world. And, uh, how are, they are the attractions, we are the attractions. Because our conferences reward attack research. That's what we have seen for the past few days here. We have seen a lot of breaking, a lot of hacking, a lot of compromising things, up to and including the last talk before mine. And the reason is that we are hackers at heart. And we do enjoy the beauty of these hacks. To have um, an exploit or a chain of exploits is as elegant and as beautiful as a um, mathematical demonstration to a mathematician or as a poem to an artist. It's the same thing. It's elegant, it's beautiful, and it, it brightens your intuition when you read it. You go through it, and you all of a sudden understand it, and something is revealed to you. And that's good. It's awesome. I'm happy that uh, my own government finds it important enough to pay me to keep doing so and keep training students to do so. However, we may have realized by now that we are not on IRC in our hacker crews anymore. What we are doing, either we like it or not, but what we are doing ends on front page news and our findings do impact the public perception. Let me give you a few examples and it will be also printed on the last slide of the deck, but let me iterate that I'm, keep, I'm taking some research and I'm not criticizing the research. I'm looking at the impact 
So do not mistake me for criticizing the research. I'm looking at the impact. So first research in the circus, um, Ghost in Air Traffic, presentation by Andre Kostin a few years ago, discussed uh, ADSB, which is a protocol used uh, in aviation. Basically, if you have ever, uh, have ever used Flight Radar 24 to track a plane, that's the protocol that uh, gives the data to that thing. There's the presentation linked over there. You can go look at it. It's probably also on YouTube somewhere. Now, the point is, basically everything that was pointed out about ADSB is correct. Because, of course, uh, Costin is a great researcher. However, the impact of those vulnerabilities is overestimated. Because those are not vulnerabilities, they are design choices. The peer-to-peer uh, -peer value of keeping ADSB open, and also open to infiltration, spoofing, and other things, is actually larger than the potential value and the complexity of making it closed. Because there's a lot of uh, challenges. Um, it's not as easy as saying, oh, we encrypt it and we sign the messages. OK, who gives out the certificates? Who decides the numbering? Uh, aviation is a very complex word. Aircrafts travel through different states. Sometimes they travel even between states that are not friends with each other. So every time that you create a regulation in aviation, it needs to take into account a lot of political things as well as commercial things. So this was not wrong. I mean, the research was OK, but there was a reason for it. On the media, and also, um, most of this happens with humans in the loop. So uh, the possibility of uh, leading to lack of safety is really low. On the media, this is the impact of the research. Next generation air traffic control vulnerable to hackers spoofing planes out of thin air. No, that's not true. That's just not true. But it's not in Andre's research either. That's not true. That's an exaggeration of impact because, of course, protocol used in some subsets of next generation air traffic control actually could lead to some secondary vulnerabilities happening. It's not a good title. Hugo Tezo, aircraft hacking, actually, hack in the box a few years ago. What did Hugo do? He basically bought an FMS, a flight management system, for the people that are passionate about aircraft so that have flown in an aircraft before. It's the huge computer in the middle between the two pilots, just to simplify it. It's the thing that is used to do a number of things on a plane, including, most critically, program the autopilot. So, Hugo bought an FMS unit on eBay and exploited it, which was cool. It's a cool hack. Then, in his talk, he also included information on how you would use ADSB that is open in order to get some information that you would need, and also showed how could this theoretically affect a plane on a simulator. Because, of course, he didn't have a plane to test this on. Now, it actually got so bad on the media, hackers use, uh, hacker uses an Android, because the, the example with ADSB was on an Android phone, an Android to remotely attack and hijack an airplane, that the FAA had to step in and actually say, no, this is, this is actually not going to happen. This was so bad that if you go and look at uh, websites talking about uh, MH370, the disappearance of the Malaysian Airlines flight, you will find that there's a lot of theories that have to do with Hugo's presentation. Not with his presentation per se, because technically that's correct, but with what happened on the media afterwards. You see where I'm going to, right? This is an Italian... So it, it, it even ended on Italian newspapers, so you, need, you know that this spread pretty badly. It says, the hacker that wanted to, die, to hijack an airplane with a smartphone and a small app. Not exactly. And the list goes on. 
And it's in, in this set of uh, examples, I used all airplanes because that's what, that was the theme of this introduction. But you could do that with any other type of systems. So uh, this is a uh, side Reagan tweeting what probably was a misguided joke and getting arrested by the FBI for a hack that could not possibly have happened. Um, and this is from like a month ago or less at Black Hat in Vegas, uh, researchers looking at the code uh, of a specific application that runs on some systems inside the 787 and saying we found vulnerabilities. And then, in, in this article, actually, which is by Andy Greenberg, so it's a very good report, actually says it in this uh, uh, line that I put in bold. Santa Marta himself admits that he doesn't have a full enough picture of the aircraft or access to an aircraft that costs $250 million to test his um, research. Now, this is a huge warning flag right there. You cannot claim consequences of an attack if you don't have the system to test the attack on. This is a huge disappointment to all of us hackers. Why? Because uh, when uh, I and Katie and Mark, well, Mark had already started a number of years before, but when I, Katie, uh, Somil started doing stuff on computers, well, if you wanted to exploit uh, VFTPD, you had to install it. That's all you needed to test your exploit. You didn't need a $250 million aircraft parked behind your office to try it. Actually, you would need it in flight even, so it's even worse. So, so this is actually the challenge that we faced whenever we look at cyber physical systems. The problem is that the larger and the more critical the physical system is, the more unlikely it is for you to have it to test. And, and, and these guys, it's not something that they're going to go beyond. It's just normal. That's the whole point of it. Why are so few people publishing research, for instance, in academia about aircraft security? Well, because we don't have the budget to buy an aircraft. In order to do automotive security research, we bought a car and we placed it in, the, in our parking lot and we experiment on it. So why is this coming up a lot with cyber physical systems? The first thing is that these are things that people see and immediately perceive as relevant to their life. So, for instance, uh, these things were so evidently important that the, um, Vivian Redding, that was the vice president of the European Commission two commissions ago, so 10 years ago, when she became vice president, she already pointed and said, okay, priority, keeping those important critical systems online. So, it's not something new. The realization that computers govern significant portions of our life is, is there, and not just between us, also with the decision makers. So the second point is that these systems are actually safety critical. They involve danger to human life. And this is very different than anything else. A banking hack that steals 1 billion euros is very important. But computers and euros do not bleed. It doesn't make for big scenographic news. Anything that affects an airplane or a car is more important to the person. And for instance, consider our research, industrial robots. The point is that you are moving from industrial robots that work like this, confined, and so if you open up the cage, the robots stop, and it's an electrical stop. You can hack into the robots all you want, but if a, a person is opening the cage, the robots will stop. To these robots. And these robots are super safe to use. This is Yumi, an ABB robot. It's very cute, right? It's built to be cute because you need not to impress fear on the people that are around it. And it's built in order to not be able to harm their human co-workers. But here's the thing. 
This is an electrical mechanism. It cannot be disabled. This is safe because there's software making it safe. So for this, security is more critical than for the previous one. They are systems that are becoming more and more automated. When you step into a car that has no steering wheel, you will damn well want to know that it's going to take you to destination. It's a huge leap of faith. It's fear of loss of control. It's exactly the same fear that uh, makes people wonder about flying. The reason why people fear flying, while flying is actually the safest way to get to destination, is because you have the feeling that once you are in the metal tube, uh, there's literally nothing that you can do to help yourself. You're just dependent that the metal tube is going to take you to destination. If you are on a ship, you think that you can swim. If you are in a car, you think that maybe you can intervene in some ways. But in a plane, nope. That's the reason why some people fear planes. And loss of control has always evoked fear. This is a film that most of you know. For the people of my generation, it's the first film that actually made something click in our mind because we saw a guy dialing in a Pentagon computer and accidentally almost starting nuclear war. But you know what? The topic of war games is not hacking. The theme of war games is fear of automation. The fear of handling the control of nuclear weapons to an artificial intelligence. This is what a 1984 artificial intelligence looks like. I, I really love this picture. That's what caused the fear that was part of the thrill of the film. Automation causes fear. If we cannot ensure people that automation is going to work very reliably, they're not going to make use of anything that we offer to them with that inside. So we cannot just keep the circus going. Because stunt hacks are important because they raise awareness. They raise up the question. But once the question is raised and people are listening to you, then you better have some answers to offer. Stunt hacks focus on specific vulnerabilities. Now, are vulnerabilities important in the long run? This is a short abstract from a keynote that uh, Dan Gear, who I think is one of the best security minds on the planet, gave at Black Hat in 2014. If you have one hour to spend, instead of listening to me, actually, you should go and listen to him. It's uh, much better. How, I'm sorry, you're stuck with me. <laughs> I'm just sorry. But in this keynote, there is this reflection. So if vulnerabilities are sparse, so there's just a few, fixing them one by one, or at least fixing one of them, reduces risk. If vulnerabilities are dense, there's many of them and many are created every time we write code. And we don't know which of the two is the case, actually. We don't have a demonstration of that. But everything points to the dense part. Fixing them actually doesn't matter. Of course, if you see a bug, you quash it. But it doesn't matter in the end. So... We are not going to solve things by squashing a vulnerability at a time. <clears throat> this is also evident in other fields. We, this, we have already learned that lesson. Security is extremely bad at keeping track of lessons we already learned. And that's a problem because we learn them at great expense. We learn this from kernel exploitation. You heard what Stefan was saying in answer to a question before. Making exploitation harder and harder and harder, harder to achieve the final goal, will make it anti-economical. Reduces the number, the pool of attackers. Reduces the pool of occasions that attack is going to be used in. And this is uh, uh, everywhere. This is an email by Bas Alberts uh, years ago on. Uh, um, 
the kernel developer, I think, make the mailing list. Where Buzz Alberts was agreeing with Brad Spengler, which, think is, uh, which I think is almost as rare as alignment of cosmic planets, saying, yeah, you know, we don't need to kill the bugs one by one. We need to quash the ways those bugs can be exploited. We need to deny attackers their goal. That's a lesson. We have learned it. We should just apply it again. And in order to apply that lesson, we need systemic thinking. We need to understand how vulnerabilities work in the context of the system that is being exploited. And as we said before, this is a problem. This understand the context is exactly the problem expressed in that last bold line there. If we don't understand how the vulnerability is going to affect the actual system, we don't have the faintest idea. Is it important or not? Oh, look, there's a buffer overflow inside one of the 14 or 15 million lines of code of my Mercedes. I can assure you there's probably 100,000 others. Is it important? Can we do something to prevent it from happening? Or can we do something even better to make it so that this vulnerability that is there, it's actually, it actually doesn't have an impact? And if we are looking at cyber physical systems, uh, impact is what happens on the physical side. We need to get to a point, uh, if possible, where we can safely ignore the fact that somebody may have compromised the computer inside. If we get there, guess what? We have secured the system. It doesn't matter if the computer gets compromised. I know that for hackers, this is almost blasphemy. But in fact, if it doesn't affect the final operation of the system, it really doesn't matter. And since we are not terribly good at making sure that hacks do not happen, and thanks for, for that, because otherwise we would be all out of a job soon. We need to make sure that when hacks do happen, they cannot affect the operation of the system. So how do we fix this? Because, hey, I said that we shouldn't raise a problem without proposing a solution. So I'm taking a bit of my own medicine and trying to propose a solution. I don't think I have a solution. But I have a few suggestions. I'll just name two. First suggestion. Thinking systemically, not thinking a specific one. Let me pick up my own research and tear it apart. So this is research that we did. We presented it at Blackhead. We presented it at security and privacy. Uh, we uh, looked at a robot and tried to break into it. Now, this is what the circus cheered for. We presented the fact that in this robot specifically, I will not go through all of the things, so you, you can go and, and pick up the slides of this talk and read them for, for yourself if you want. But we presented the fact that inside this robot, which is a half a ton of metal costing about 80,000 euros, all of the components do not do code signing. My cell phone does, but big heavy robot doesn't. So whatever you upload it through whatever vulnerability you find, the robot will blindly accept it. This is a stupid vulnerability. So the circus cheered for this. Uh, auto configuration, there is a, a, a directory in the robot which is similar to a virtual directory such as slash proc on a Linux system that you may be more uh, familiar with where you can read configuration parameters. But if you write, you also write the configuration parameters. And if you write a specifically named command, the robot will execute whatever you write in there. Circus cheers. Do I need to comment? This is literally the example that is on my slides for computer security 101 of a buffer overflow. And additionally, since this is on a robot, and the robot runs an operating system that is meant to do things timely and not necessarily securely, the robot does not have address randomization. It does not have stack protection. So you can exploit this just like in uh, um, smashing the stack for fun and profit. 
1996 exploitation all the way. Circus cheers. This is not important. None of these three slides was important. This is what ended up uh, uh, being uploaded in the audience at Black Hat. This is what ended up on the press. Catastrophe warning. Watch an industrial robot get hacked. Watch hackers sabotage an industrial robot arm aid at SAS. Hackers are remotely controlling industrial robots. Now the sky is falling. My favorite headline. So basically, we inadvertently created a publicity crisis for robot industry. Actually, the interesting part of the paper was the next section, which was about uh, how do you actually avoid this from happening, which is not patching the robot. It's also patching the robot. But patching the robot is useless because that code is all proprietary, has never been scrutinized. There's gazillions of vulnerabilities in there. You're not going to solve it by squashing one vulnerability at a time. I can throw an infinite number of PhD students at that robot, and it will not be solved. The way you solve it is, yeah, professors count work hours in number of PhD students per subject. That's, that's how we do it. No worries. So we, for instance, explored how, what do you do post-exploitation and how to close those post-exploitation strategies instead of closing the vulnerabilities. We explored the threat landscape so that we found ways to minimize the impact. The discussion on electrical versus software-based controls is one example. We explored the architectural changes that would improve resilience, such as signatures, maybe. Um, we suggested research directions for doing that. For instance, how do we statically analyze the more and more complex programs that are going to be used in robots and in deployed uh, production lines in the future? Crickets, because we don't know. Um, just so that you understand how deep the problem is, when a robotics engineer wants a robot to talk to another robot, usually they code a socket connection. Like literally they randomly write a socket connection to send data and a socket connection to receive data. Which we all know is the single most difficult task in creation, like preparing data, sending them across the network and parsing them on the other hand in a secure way is literally one of the hardest things to get right. These are not computer engineers. These are automation engineers. They have never been trained to write a line of C code. The probability of them getting this right is abysmal. We know how to do better than that. We already know this specific lesson. We have already learned it. Well, evidently not, but we should. Um, we identified another thing that is very interesting, like industrial routers, which are these big, bulky um, connection systems that protect industrial networks. They cost between five and 10,000 euros each, and they are glorified consumer routers. They are no better than your $100 router that you pick up at Costco. Their software quality is abysmal. And uh, 85,000 networks around the world are behind these devices. So this is what was actually important. Figuring out how do we make it so that this thing that is riddled with vulnerabilities, and there's no way that it isn't, this ecosystem gets better. Second suggestion. We need to embed security much earlier into, into the design process. And... You know, this is one of those phrases. I started uh, hearing it when I started looking at security 20 years ago. More than. And it's still true. Let me use automotive for an example. Charlie and Chris's ah, right? Taking over a car from remote from another state and driving it off the road. But lots of hacks have happened in the past few years. It's been a very prolific thing. There's been a number of talks about automotive hacking here. There's people doing automotive hacking villages at DEF CON. It's been popularized. It's a popular sport, hacking into cars. And the reason is that all these acts, uh, at the end, uh, 
are basically the same act. They're all the same. Find uh, an exploit in one of the gateway systems, get into the car network. The car network is basically a trust-based network where every component trusts each other component, and so you can do whatever the hell you want. All of these attacks are the same. We can demonstrate a thousand. Will this demonstration of a thousand attacks change anything? No. What we need is actually a way to solve this, which is not quashing the vulnerabilities in these gateways. Not alone, also, but not alone. Because when you quash the vulnerabilities in the gateway, when you find a vulnerability, patching the car is not as simple as patching VFTPD. This is what FCA ended up doing for patching the cars. They mailed each and every single owner of the affected vehicle a USB key, instructing them to slam the USB key inside the car and updating it. Which is, at the same time, the best thing that they could possibly do at that point, and an awful idea. Because you are training people to slam unknown USB keys in your cars and let the car update itself. So, the, this is the defense circus, which is almost the same, but funnier than the, the offensive circus. So, how do we make it so that this does not happen? Well, this will happen from time to time, but how do we make so that this does not happen or is not so impactful? Well, there's, there's a number of problems here. The, the issue is that CAN is a trusted network, and it's also unable to support any reasonable authentication or encryption mechanism because it is very short messages. Now, things are changing there in the industry, but there's a lot of research that has tried to address this. But almost everything that we say is, uh, well, every single hacker that has done this is like, yeah, this protocol sucks, change it. And as soon as you say change it, all of the automotive people in the room raise their asses and walk out. Because you can't. That's a very beautiful suggestion that will never work. Because it's impossible cost-wise. It's going to happen in the next generation of vehicles, but not in the current one. Uh, lots of research tries to come up with magic intrusion detection systems. Hey, I'm an intrusion detection systems guy. I wrote my PhD thesis on intrusion detection. I'm suddenly relevant again to say intrusion detection systems did not work when I wrote my thesis in 2006. Thanks God they didn't realize it before giving me my PhD. They did not work throughout the next few years, and they do not work out now. And in particular, even if they did work in this specific context, there's an issue. What do you do with them once you have detected that there is an attack? Do you turn on a light on the dashboard of the vehicle with a guy in a balaclava? <laughs> and the owner goes to the manual and the manual says, yeah, pull over very slowly, call police. What do you do when you know that there's an attack going on? Actually, there are ways, good ways to use this. But I'm saying that lots of research actually is not really that practically applicable. Squashing bugs in thousands of combinations of ECUs and firmware, of course, is never going to work. And so we need to embed secure design on networks based on the risks. And lo and behold, the compromise of those ECUs is not a risk per se. The risks in an automotive, in a vehicle, are basically four types of risks. Either someone wants to kill the owner or the people around it, safe operations of the vehicle. Someone wants to steal the vehicle. Someone wants to track the owner of the vehicle or get some personal information of the vehicle. Someone wants to violate intellectual property. These are the four things that are going to happen. Three of these are going to impact the brand. One is going to directly impact the, in, the, 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 the OEM, the manufacturer. So once you've done this, then the threats that you're going to face are actually kind of evident. What's going to happen? Well, one thing is already happening. Single biggest cybersecurity threat to vehicles, theft. 
most vehicles are stolen by abusing their electronic keys. That's a cyber attack, if you want. We've never called it like that. But if you want to set to seek what is the most common threat against vehicles, it's theft. What's another threat that could happen to vehicles? Well, that somebody create a ransomer scheme for them. Is it going to happen? Yes. When is it going to happen? I don't know. When it's going to be worth it. How do you know? Because obviously it's going to happen. There's no way around it. So how do we make sure that these end goals of attackers cannot happen? Well, fortunately enough, we can break them down according to the components in the vehicles and according to their functionalities. And once we have done that, we are able to map that on how we design, for instance, the networks. Where do we place the security protections in the network? We cannot really filter all of the messages, but we can filter some. We cannot really embed security on all ECUs, but we can emb embed it on some functionalities. This is a reasonable approach to try to integrate security into vehicle design. Because if we go to the designers and we say, oh, it's easy, you just need to throw away everything and start from scratch, that's a beautiful suggestion that cannot be applied. So these are the two big ones that I think are uh, in my list of uh, suggestions. But then maybe uh, you have some, and you know, we, we have a lot of work to do. So everybody's suggestions are as good as mine to take away for this. My conclusions on this are that one, and I'm sorry to say that, <laughs> I'm, I like attack research, but we focus too much on attack research. Because vulnerability discovery exploitation is cool, but it doesn't matter. In the grand scheme of things, each single vulnerability does not matter. In the grand scheme of things, stunt hacking is needed before somebody takes notice. Then, stunt hacking distracts the industry and the public from sensible risk reduction. The sky is falling, works for a limited time, and is not really effective in getting the sensible things done. Because the effect that you get is, oh, everything can be broken, so it doesn't matter if we protect it. Or, even worse, uh, okay, so we protect uh, things uh, when they get broken, which is way too late. We need to focus on at least three things that I can think of. Structural resilience, so building th things that can be broken gracefully. Architectural changes to make it so that in complex systems, the impact of one vulnerability does not propagate to everything at once, such as in cars or such as in robots. And in particular, impact reduction. We, we need to, to reapply something that we have already learned. Deny attackers their goal. Not the attack. The goal. It's easier here. The goal is physical. We have all sorts of layer that we can use to deny attackers their goal. If we make it so that in the worst case, the robot stops, even if we are not achieving that through a computer, we are stopping one of the attacker's goals. If we make it so that it's impossible to upload a changed firmware, we avoid Ukraine's power network to be taken down. If we make it so that it's impossible to um, create uh, an impact on the whole vehicle by starting from one single component, we make Charlie and Miller work way more in order to drive the next journalist off the road. So these are the things that matter. When we are doing, when we are trying to secure uh, cyber physical systems, this is the road we need to take. 
And as hard as it is to do security research in the offensive world, finding reasonable ways to do this is way harder. So I do not encourage you to join me in doing the easier thing of securing systems. I'm encouraging you to do the harder thing of securing systems. Because, you know, breaking some of these systems is like stealing candies from babies, and that's not something that we do as hackers. Thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions, I'm ready to take them. Grazie, grazie, Stefano. Grazie, Stefano. Thanks. So, um, let's uh, throw it open to the floor for any questions. And uh, by the way, we have swag. If you have the most upvoted question, I think I know which one's going to win. Why are you so handsome? <laughs> <laughs> so what ruggedly we, handsome. Yeah, I ruggedly like that. handsome. I will steal that from my, for my Twitter bio, so by we, far. We, why don't yeah, you answer that? It's going to be on my Twitter bio in like so next since, 10 minutes. Since I brought that up, why don't you answer that first? <laughs> no, okay, just kidding. Uh, we'll come back to Slido, but I wanted to throw it open to the floor first. So prizes for the most upvoted question and prize for a question that you choose as your favorite. Okay. So... So the thing about stunt hacking is that we have an incentive as researchers to do highly visible right. work like that. It obviously, it advances our career. But uh, for security, it also advances the awareness of the, li of the potential problems there. And where is the incentive for the manufacturers to take on the investment to do the design changes that's necessary to construct like secure systems? Oh, that's actually, uh, that's actually an awesome point that I forgot to make. Yes, the uh, the problem is not. I mean, the incentive for us in doing attack research is evident, and I'm I mean I'm fine with that. I don't I don't think we should stop doing that. God forbid, we should just you know kind of partition our time differently. But in the case of the, for the second half of your question, which is the important one, the point is, what is the incentive to the OEM? The incentive to the OEM is selling cars selling cars and not incurring expenses because they sold cars. So um, in the case of automotive, for instance, there is a strong incentive. There are a lot of regulations related to safety that they need to adhere to, and uh, cybersecurity is becoming part of these considerations. But this is not true across all the industry. It's true for automotive. It's true for aviation. But for instance, uh, in the industrial control systems area, it's way more... Uh, it's way more gray, the economics uh, of how you do that. In the robotics area, it's more gray, the economics of how you do that. So um, the ways we get that, to get, we get, and in IoT, like a consumer IoT, there's basically zero incentive. The incentive is to put out whatever next bullshit you want to put out and, and not test it, actually. I, I was uh, in another, doing another slide deck. I looked at for some of the most absurd IoT things, uh, and I think the top for me, is this um, IoT wine bottle. It's a wine bottle with screens on all the sides. You put in wine from an unmarked bottle, and then you scan the code on the unmarked bottle, and this downloads all sorts of information to color the bottle. And I was looking at it, and I was like, I just can't even, what, what, what is this? So the good thing is, uh, since the wine is not affected, Whatever hack on that bottle just doesn't make sense. That's a good thing. The positive thing is that it's not safety critical. The negative thing is, do you really think that there is an incentive to secure such a stupid device? Of course not. There's no incentive. That's not part of the economical model. So the only way we can do that is if, as a community, we figure out ways to create, to pick up these externalities and make the vendors, the OEMs, the manufacturers pay for them. It's the same thing as with pollution. Pollution is an externality. It's a cost of the manufacturing that is put on society. So the only way to make that go away is that you regulate it out of existence. You make it costlier to pollute than to actually fix it. And the same thing goes for security, unfortunately, which is a discussion that no manufacturer no vendor has ever wanted to hear. But in the cyber-physical systems uh, um, field, 
It's just going to happen. In Europe, it's happening. The European Commission has created a Cybersecurity Act, which will create a set of uh, industry vertical regulations for doing some basic security testing of devices. Just like you do basic safety testing for electrical systems, you will do basic security testing for devices. That's one of the roads. The other road is imposing costs. That's the two roads. If you want to go the free market way, you need to impose the costs. If you want to go the European regulation way, you need to build regulation. <coughs> Grazie. So uh, any, we'll take one more question from the audience, and then we'll go to Slido. Any, anyone from the audience? Is that a hand up? No? Okay. If not, then let's take the first one on the top. The okay. Ten so question, uh, ten votes. What is the trust awareness trade-off with stunt hacking? While some stunt hacks bring attention to an under-examined issue, it also comes at the cost of trust and inhibits future engagement. I think I, I know who wrote this question. Anyway, um, that's exactly the trade-off. And I would like to, um, not to point out to the obvious part, which is the one about bringing attention to an under-examined issue, but to the later part. Performing a stunt hack in certain ways is going to raise the attention and to also bring the vendors to the table. Performing a stunt hack in other ways raises the attention, but since it scares the vendors into not talking to you, it actually pushes the solution of the problem away. So if your objective is to make the stunt research because we have our personal incentive in appearing, then either way works well for you. But if the incentive is trying to improve the world a little, then you want to do your stunt hack in such a way that it doesn't scare the vendors away. Uh, aviation industry is a specific example of this. We tried for a number of years to get uh, aviation people at Blackhead, for instance, discussing vulnerabilities with researchers. And they don't come because they think that the engagement uh, is not going to be positive. The same thing happened with uh, automotive until a few years ago. So it's good to do stunt hacking to raise awareness of a problem. But if you want to solve the problem, this must also take into consideration how it affects the vendor. And if the vendor is going to be so pissed off that they don't want to have to do with hackers anymore. OK, so um, next. So you are saying that the recent article about a bug that could make a female sex robot strangle a man was exaggerated. That's disappointing. So first of all, <laughs> I am pro freedom of expression and choice. If a female sex robot ever develops a conscience and says no, I will support the female sex robot to do whatever it takes to protect herself. However, however, this specific article, this specific article was bullshit. <laughs> I, will, I will say that in the most diplomatic way that I can, but it was complete bullshit. <laughs> All right, we have, I think we'll squeeze in maybe one or two more questions. Any more questions from the audience? If not, we'll continue with Slido. All right, go ahead. How do you think the governments uh, should regulate such uh, stunt tax? They shouldn't. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> we, sh we should. So the, uh, the actual longer answer is we should be responsible enough that this doesn't happen. We don't, we don't want to make someone think that they need to regulate us. Because that's not going to work well for them first. And it's not going to work very well for us either. Um, do you think that these stunt hacks can have a benefit in terms of drawing new talent into the industry, or does it scare them away? No, I think that this is, a, this is probably a positive point that I should point out in any future version of this talk. Yes, stunt hacks do attract new people into the fold. Um, the question may be, are those exactly the people that we want to attract into the fold? I will probably want to think about that question for a while before giving an answer. Okay, one last question. Okay. How does a PhD candidate keep up with his research direction with the seismic changing landscape of cybersecurity? You just abandon yourself to the flow. You just, 
just put your trust in the force and in your Jedi master oh, and, <laughs> and abandon yourself to the flow. <laughs> oh, that was wonderful. Well said. Okay, with that, do you want to choose uh, the winner of your favorite question? Um, I think... I, I, by the way, I do know who asked the first question. You know about about you being ruggedly handsome. Yes, yes. I, I, <laughs> no, that 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 one would be an obvious choice. But I think that the question about uh, um, the uh, involvement of uh, people uh, in uh, drawn by the stunt acts uh, that's actually something that I didn't think about. So that's the most helpful question to me. Okay. Who was that? Uh, I, I, I was it know. from here or? How, yeah. Oh, so How, it was probably uh, anonymous. Uh, no, it's the one of the last ones. Okay, it's probably anonymous, <laughs> so we don't know who it was. Okay, but so if if you know who you were, and so show come of hands. Which one? It's uh, yeah, yeah, the new talent one. Yeah. This one. You so own if up, it's you, you, just come up and claim your raise prize. Raise your hand if you want to. Oh, oh that was you. Oh, <laughs> ah, great, awesome. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so thank you very much thank once you. again for okay. attending this talk. Big round of applause, please, for Stefano. <laughs>